Hi, so I believe that I'm um, live at the conference now. So thank you for uh, bearing with me, uh, getting prepared, and I hope you're having a good day. Um, sorry not to be there. And I also have another apology, which is that um, there's some building work next door. And wherever I seem to sit around my house, a drill seems to follow me. So if it's a bit loud, I do, I do apologize, but hopefully um, you can't hear it. So today I'm going to be uh, presenting on electric vehicles and charging infrastructure and hopefully make that relevant uh, to what you're discussing around high power charging today at the summit. So EVs have come a long way even during the pandemic um, and you will have noticed there's been a lot of sales. So in 2019 EV sales just 2.1 million whereas in 2020 3.1 million and this year looking like globally they're going to surpass 5 million. What we've seen in 2020 is that Europe actually caught up China and sold more EVs in that year. This year, we think China is probably going to supersede Europe again, um, but they do sell a lot of the smaller EVs. Um, so a slight difference there in what you in, in the type of vehicle that we see. And in terms of that tracker, that's looking at both battery electric vehicles, but also the plug in hybrid vehicles. And globally, we see battery electrics accounting for around 68 percent of sales. That does change by region, though. So if you think about Germany, for example, where they've got incentives for plug in hybrids, the percentage of PHEVs is getting more close to, to sort of 50 percent of all of those sales. So a bit of a difference. And like I say, the government incentives really changing how that works. So within the department I work in at Bloomberg NEF, uh, we work on advanced transport. Uh, one part of the team writes on autonomous vehicles and the trend to um, smaller uh, mobility modes, micro mobility, autonomous cars. And I work on electrified transport. But when we write this report, we also have other teams come in looking at the trends on oil demand and how that will reduce over time. Um, the trend in batteries and how we'll need more of those. What chemistries are there? How does that affect the material demand for those? So this report is really big. And one of the things we did this year is also look at net zero. So we have a main scenario called the economic transition scenario. We also have a separate scenario that looks at net zero and how by 2050 we can have a fleet of all electric vehicles across every segment. Today, I'm largely just going to talk about the vehicle sales, the electricity demand and the charging infrastructure. But if you want to know more, then feel free to reach out to have a, a look at those impacts. So what we see happening over the next few decades is a big rise in EV sales and the share of those sales of all car sales increasing. And we do that across four key categories. On the left hand side, you've got two and three wheelers then you've got buses, vans and cars and then trucks. And although I just showed you that EV sales have risen fast, it's, it's worth having some um, realism on where we are today. So of EV share of sales today, 44% uh, um, of those are electric in the two and three wheeler segment and 39% in the bus segment. So quite successful, largely driven by regions such as China with the buses, but also with the two and three wheelers moving out to Southeast Asia and India. With passenger vehicles, just 4% of sales globally being electric, which shows you how far we've really got to go. There's more success in Europe, and we've seen a lot of regions um, go over the 10% EV share of sales. And we expect that to increase this year as well um, as we get to the end of 2021. Largely driven in places like Europe by the fuel economy standards, and they are starting to increase in places like the US as well um, with the Biden administration coming in. And then you see on the right hand side, a real uh, failure of the market so far has been on the electric truck segment. Um, and we see that continuing. So these figures showing you by 2040 in our base case scenario, how much of the share of sales do we expect to be electric? What you can see here is that um, the two and three wheelers and the buses get a lot, long way there and, and the cars as well to being fully electric sales by 2040, but still lagging behind on the buses largely driven by a lack of technology, a lack of infrastructure. Um, and we see that change, but policy is not so strong there as well. And this just shows you what that means compared to a net zero scenario. So across those four categories that I talked about, the dotted line shows you if you want to have a full electric fleet by 2050, how do we how do we get there? Whereas the solid line in each category is, is kind of the, the gap to reach that in our base case scenario. And you can see on the right hand side, again, those trucks really a long way away from being fully electric from 2050. So require more policy. We have started to see some of that. 
So in the latest alternative fuel directive um, and the proposal uh, within the Fit for 55 in Europe, for example, there's more talk about putting money in for trucks and the infrastructure that will be required for certainly those harder to, to move areas such as long haul travel, um, but still some way to go. So all of this, these uh, vehicles will require some charging infrastructure and uh, there's there's other providers of charging infrastructure than, than NLX that you can see on the slide. But I like this picture because it shows all of the different types uh, that are available or certainly gives a good idea of those that we can see. Now, today, a lot of the charging infrastructure um, is required at homes for passenger EVs. So drivers buy a passenger EV. They probably uh, live in a detached house because they're, they're quite well off and the vehicles are quite expensive and they install a home charger and that meets the needs of a lot of their driving. Now that isn't necessarily the same when you think about battery electric drivers and plug-in hybrid drivers. Some of those plug-in hybrid drivers will uh, charge at home, but they might not necessarily have a charger. They could just use the cable in their car. Um, so the percentage might be something like 70 to 80% of battery electric vehicle drivers in Europe and the US today with a home charger, but maybe lower than 50% for the plug-in hybrid drivers. Um, we see that kind of change by regions. Um, in public, though, we're also required to have charging infrastructure, one, to meet the needs of people who want to travel further, but two, also for those who can't install a home charger, and that's going to become bigger over time. And we see around 1.5 million chargers in public globally, certainly much more being installed in places like China, around 300,000 a year going in there in comparison to around 100,000 in um, Europe and around 10,000 in the US. So a big differential there. What is important to notice, though, is whilst there's a big differentiation on public charging, and that can give you the perception some of these countries have not installed any infrastructure, if you actually looked at the amount of home chargers in China and the amount of public chargers, it kind of balances out with the amount of home chargers and public chargers you might see in Europe in terms of the amount of chargers per vehicle across the two categories. So we forecast how many of these chargers are going to be needed in future, and this is a basic overview of that methodology. So what you can see on the on the left hand side is we know in, in kind of 12 countries globally how many EVs we expect in the fleet by those types of vehicles. We do some predictions on how far those vehicles will travel and the efficiency of those vehicles. And that gives us an electricity demand. And then we say, well, not every vehicle will charge the same. Some of them will charge at different locations and different powers of charging infrastructure. And the utilization of that infrastructure will also change over time. Today, the utilization is low, but that that is not sustainable for businesses over time. So firstly, with the electricity demand, what I'm showing here is the net zero scenario, about 1.5 times bigger than the baseline. But I think this is important because that's really what society is kind of aiming for is net zero. And what you can see is by 2050, these trucks, buses and vans take up a lot of the electricity demand that is required. So you can see that getting up to kind of 45 percent. And that means we're going to need more high power charging infrastructure which is what we're obviously discussing at this conference today. Um, and here is an example of some of those for Mercedes vehicles, um, I believe, in Europe. Now, another thing to note is the demand for, from autonomous and robo taxis within our forecast. So by about 2035, we see that that fleet getting bigger, starting to eat into the shared vehicle market, but also the passenger vehicle market. And these vehicles will require a different type of charging infrastructure. What is the point in having a um, autonomous vehicle if you have to plug it in by hand when you charge. So that might need wireless charging, such as this Hyundai concept you can see on the screen, or robotic charging. And there's a few different types of this and reasons why you might want robotic charging. This one is a robot by Volkswagen that drives around and has a robotic arm. But equally, when we get up to the high power charging that might be required for some of these trucks, you can see robotic arms also being useful because of the weight of those cables that might be needed and the difficulty getting those plugged in when you're at multi megawatt powers. If we think about that electricity demand and how that sits globally, it's around 15 to 20 percent of global electricity demand by 2050. In regions such as Europe, it can actually sit at that figure around 2040. And um, industry is concerned about this change in demand quite quickly, particularly on the distribution network. If you think today, though, smart charging has proved successful, and by that I mean the ability to stop and start charging on demand, but governments are trying to figure out the legislation to ensure that that is widespread. How does everybody have a smart charger? 
How is the signal communicated? Is it secure to do so so we don't end up with the grid falling down? The second side of this, when smart charging evolves, is that the vehicles will send energy back to the grid. And we've done analysis on this, and this can prove to be a very um, impactful feature of a vehicle, both in terms of perhaps providing some economic incentive to the driver, but also to limit the need for grid upgrades. If everybody did a couple of kilowatt hours of arbitrage a day, perhaps absorbing some energy with their car when it was um, le the least carbon intensive, or when it was the cheapest and absorbing that when otherwise coal might be going, you could actually eliminate uh, both curtailment of wind, but also fossil fuel production with that fleet. There's many scenarios, but if, if you uh, do a limited amount, you, you can make a big difference to the energy market. Governments are starting to notice that. So I already referenced the European Alternative Fuel Directive. And within that, we're starting to see um, governments say, actually, we would like DNOs to discuss with car makers and charging firms how they can make this work. So V2G and bidirectional charging are coming and they're going to be important. And the picture I show on the side is the Ford F-150 um, electric vehicle. And this has the ability to do bidirectional charging. Whether these charges are robotic or wireless, we have a forecast for those, and we expect around 300 million by 2040 in our base case. You can see these split by uh, home and work, public, and e-bus and truck on the slide, uh, dominated really by those home charges within here. And the split on public um, has around 15% of those being the DC fast chargers, which seems quite small, but I should come on to that um, in a few slides time. For all of this, infrastructure will require a lot of investment. So this is looking out to 2050. So by 2040, in the base case, around 300 million chargers, going up to around 500 million by 2050 um, in the base case, and around 700 million in the net zero. In net zero, requiring somewhere around a trillion to 1.5 trillion investment by 2050. And that's not including all of the, the grid upgrades that you might need. So that's the hardware and the local installation. If you go further out into the grid, you could double this figure. And that's where some of that bidirectional charging that I just discussed comes into play as well in limiting those. When we think about all those charges, and I, I kind of described this on, on the chart, there's a lot of home charges, about 87% of all that we're predicting. And there's a limited amount um, of those being fast chargers in public or for these buses and truck. So just the 2% you can see on the screen at the top left. But don't be um, thinking that they're not important, that 2%. They actually deliver somewhere around 50% of energy demand. And that is reasonably easy to understand when you think about buses and trucks. They drive a long way. They have a lot of um, weight on them, and therefore they use a lot of energy. But it's not so easy to understand if we think about the light duty fleet. So I just want to explain how we think about that in our forecast and give you some ideas there. So for a slow charger, we see it delivering between one and five vehicles demand in a year. So one or two for a home charger, depending on if you have a charger for one or two vehicles in your household, and then about five for those slow chargers in public. Now, we think that is the case because of one, the lower amount of power that these chargers can deliver, but also the lower amount of utilization we see. A home charger today delivers energy probably every three days when somebody plugs in and does so for around three three hours. And we don't see that changing a great deal when we think about the driving patterns of people using a public charger. So we think they might plug in every day, a different car comes along and uses it, but we don't see that you end up with huge amounts more utilization because somebody, if they have one outside their house, might use that charger in an evening and block it. So it's got low utilization. And we don't see that charger being used so heavily in the day because it's probably not in a location that many people will be at. Whereas for ultra fast chargers, we see that they can deliver energy for say 100 vehicles or more in a year. And that's partly due to the fact that they're about 50 times more powerful or can be, but also because they can be more heavily utilized. Somebody coming along, using it for 15 minutes and then moving away. And if we think about what we've seen today in the market, and sorry if this slide is not the most visible, DC chargers are delivering around 30 to 60 kilowatt hours in Europe and uh, the US. And you can see that from Fastnet and EVgo on a daily basis. And the AC chargers are delivering less. So we've got an example on the slide, Volta, which is um, a US charging network, delivering, AC, uh, delivering an AC network around 25 kilowatt hours a day. But that's a free network. And is that sustainable over time? And will that model be picked up everywhere else? In the other networks that we've seen, largely a lower amount of energy delivered from those AC chargers. If we look in our forecast and how we see that 
uh, moving over time. The two bars here show in the first decade, 2020 to 2030, an average amount of kilowatt hours delivered per day for each type of charger, and the purple bar the decade after that going to 2040. And you can see just a huge difference in the amount of energy delivered per day in the faster chargers compared to the slow chargers. So we're getting up to multiple hundreds of kilowatt hours from those 150 to 350 kilowatt chargers. Now, this aligns with some of the industry thinking in the groups. EVGO's investor presentation says by 2027, if you work through the numbers, that they will be delivering around 400 kilowatt hours per charger per day. Now, we don't necessarily agree with that. And you can see the 150 kilowatt chargers delivering around 150 kilowatts a day in the next decade. But we certainly see the trend moving to more kilowatt hours being delivered for this charging infrastructure. And that has an effect on the amount of chargers we'll see in total and how you can think about that in terms of the EVs. So today we're seeing something around 50 to 60 percent of um, cars with a home charger. And that plays to the fact that we see more BEVs having a home charger than, than PHEVs. But we see that lowering over time. More people having a home charger uh, when they have two EVs, for example, they might not get a second home charger. And more people adopting EVs when they can't install a home charger at all. And then the middle chart here is showing you how many EVs there are per public connector. And there is differences globally. China, five EVs per public connector. Europe, closer to 10. The US, 20 EVs per public connector. But we see that rising over time, getting to between 30 and 40 EVs per public connector. And that is partly due to this higher utilization that we expect to see over time. A more heavily used set of chargers means you'll need less of them, but also this increase in power that we expect to see over time as well. Um, now, you might not agree with what I've just shown you, and it's quite a contentious area. So we have a model, clients can use that, and you can see part of it on the right on the left hand side of the screen. And what that does is um, allows clients to change uh, the amount of uh, assumptions that we have, whether that be the cost of the chargers, the utilization of the chargers or where they're at, um, and then look at the sensitivities. Also drill down. Today, what I've shown you is perhaps a global view, some cases a little bit lower than that. You may want to look at a specific country and you can do that in the model. On the right hand side, we also have data sets looking at the public charging network, for example, showing here the European network on the right hand side, how many chargers are in each country, Every six months, that's updated with data, so you can see the differences. And it shows granularity going down to cities, operators, and also the power of those chargers. So you can look at, for example, the ultra-fast chargers, where they've been installed, who's doing so, what power are they uh, going to be. So just to say thank you for today. Um, I, not as much interaction with me being here, so I, I hope that's been useful. Um, feel free to reach out um, if you want to know more. and. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your time at the conference.